It's The Real News. I'm Aaron Maté. The sight of a U.S. president meeting with a North Korean leader was a historic first. But also historic was President Trump's pledge to halt U.S. war games on the Korean Peninsula. The war games are very expensive. We pay for a big majority of them. We fly in bombers from Guam. I said it when I first started. I said, where do the bombers come from? Guam. Nearby. I said, oh, great. Nearby. Where's nearby? Six and a half hours. Six and a half hours. That's a long time for these big, massive planes to be flying to South Korea to practice and then drop bombs all over the place and then go back to Guam. I know a lot about airplanes. It's very expensive. And, and I didn't like it. And what I, what I did say is, and I think it's very provocative. I have to tell you, Jennifer, it's a very provocative uh, situation. When, when I see that and you have a country right next door. So under the circumstances that we're negotiating a very comprehensive, complete deal, I think it's inappropriate to be having war games. That's President Trump speaking to reporters shortly after he met with Kim Jong-un in Singapore. Now, an end to U.S. war games has been a key North Korean goal for years. And with that as a starting point, will the two sides reach the ultimate goal, peace and complete denuclearization? And if they do, then here's another question. What could peace in the Korean Peninsula mean for Trump's other priorities, including confronting Iran and also a trade war with China? Well, joining me from Singapore is James Dorsey. He is an author and senior fellow at the Rajaratnam School of International Studies in Singapore. Welcome, James. Uh, let's start with this pledge from Donald Trump to halt U.S. war games. In fact, the only real verifiable concrete pledge to come from the summit, otherwise the sides committed to denuclearization, but the details of that will have to be worked out. Here, though, Trump has actually pledged to stop doing uh, what North Korea has has been wanting the U.S. to stop doing for a long time, which is are these massive war games on its borders. Your, your thoughts on that commitment? Well, if you look at the whole uh, picture, you have a lot of declarations of intention uh, with no meat on the skeleton. What the statement does not have, which were key words that the Trump administration wanted, in other words, a verifiable irrevocable denuclearization. Obviously, uh, Kim did not concede other words verifiable and irrevocable. And on the other hand, you have this giveaway, a giveaway that is certainly not going to go down well with U.S. allies, South Korea and Japan, and most probably is going to be uh, problematic with the Pentagon. So it's not quite clear why this was given away uh, in exchange for basically nothing but why do you think it was given away? And I mean, do you object to the fact that it was? Well, what I think what, what I think we've seen today is really the way Trump approaches negotiations and international relations. You look at the press conference that he gave, an hour-long press conference, which uh, was far more friendly than many many of his other press conferences and encounters with the media, and in which he was clearly basking in the fact that he was on the world stage and he was the world's puppeteer. Now, the other thing is that he clearly believes very firmly with an enormous self-confidence in his ability to instinctively understand what the other party wants and that his personality inspires enough confidence for uh, him to make agreements or understandings without any, uh, any indication that he can ensure that they are going to be implemented. To give you one example, he talked about uh, at the last minute having agreed with Kim on the destruction of a um, engine uh, testing site he didn't bother to put that in the declaration. So all we have at this point is his word for it. We have no idea what Kim's view of it is. And there certainly is no written record of this. Let me go to a clip uh, from MSNBC last night. There was a lot of uh, 
laments on in corporate media coverage about the summit, um, decrying the fact that uh, Trump was treating uh, Kim Jong-un as an equal, flying the flags side by side at their ceremony. And a, a former uh, NATO commander uh, was speaking to MSNBC. Uh, his name is James Stavridis. And he was talking about the reasons for uh, this massive U.S. troop presence in South Korea that, that President Trump has appeared to put on the negotiating table. We ought to remember our troops are there not as an act of goodwill to South Korea. They're there to enhance U.S. influence in the region, to ensure that we keep those sea lanes of communication open, that our trade can flow freely, that we have a voice in the events there for the exact same reason that we still have about 50,000 troops in Europe. Um, they're not there as an act of goodwill. They're there to accomplish U.S. national security objectives. So we draw them down at risk to those objectives, and it is very short-sighted to say, oh, yeah, this will be a twofer. We can reduce tension and save some money mm. by getting our troops off the peninsula. Not the right way to think about this one. So that's former NATO commander James Servitis in a moment of candor last night on MSNBC, uh, saying that the U.S. is has massive numbers of troops in South Korea, uh, not as an act of goodwill, but he says it's for the national security interests. But if you notice the reasons uh, that he explains for what those interests are, have nothing to do with security. He talks about having a voice, having influence, uh, opening up, opening up sea routes. So, do you think that for the Trump administration, uh, this massive troop presence inside the peninsula is negotiable? Uh, is negotiable. Trump, the way he's speaking today, talked about wanting to bring them home. Well, I think it's certainly for Trump negotiable. He's made that very clear. Whether it's for the administration uh, negotiable, we'll have to wait and see. I would think that uh, the Pentagon and maybe even the State Department are not that happy with this. I also think that uh, beyond what the um, former NATO commander said, is that there's an issue here of the reliability of the United States if it suddenly backs out of military commitments that it's made to its allies and does so unilaterally. Right. Okay. And so in terms of looking at this from a skeptical point of view, certainly on the Korean Peninsula, uh, you have massive overwhelming support. Uh, something like 80% of the population supports peace, uh, supports denuclearization. Um, and that's obviously a laudable goal. But in terms of what cynical aims might be behind this from the point of view of the Trump administration, which has very different, a very different agenda than North Korea and South Korea uh, have, um, what do you think this deal could do when it comes to Trump's designs, when it comes to Iran? He's just pulled out of the nuclear deal. And also with China, because just before the summit, he basically launched this trade war, issuing a series of demands, including a, a a reduction of the trade imbalance by tens of billions of dollars, demands that are obviously non-starters for China. So how could a possible peaceful outcome on the peninsula impact Trump's other goals? Obviously, if he pulls off denuclearization of North Korea, then that strengthens his argument of taking a much firmer line towards Iran and walking away from the current uh, nuclear agreement. That's a big if. Uh, whether the Iranians are going to buy into it, that remains to be seen. What I think it may do is, uh, if indeed succeeds in North Korea, give him license to take an even more aggressive attitude towards um, Iran. With, with regard to China, he's going to need China in any denuclearization process with uh, North Korea. And North Korea remains a major influence in North, uh, uh, sorry, China remains a major influence in North Korea. So I think that in terms of what this is going to do in its maneuverability with China, maybe less than meets the eye. And the massive US troop presence in South Korea, how much of a factor uh, do you think uh, China is in, in the US, the US deliberations? over keeping those forces there? Again, obviously in, um, uh, in Trump thinking, not that, not that much. 
he's been willing to give, basically give this away. In fact, you know, the pledge not to hold military exercises can be read as a first step towards the withdrawal of U.S. forces. Uh, I think that what you're going to see is a lot of resistance, both within Congress, as from the parts of the administration, particularly the Pentagon, against a, uh, a cancellation of military exercises, let alone the withdrawal of U.S. forces. It would obviously, if the United States were to withdraw forces from uh, from the Korean Peninsula, this would be doing exactly what China wants and exactly what North Korea wants. Right. And, you know, in terms of Congress, it's worth remembering that uh, when President Clinton reached agreement with North Korea in the 90s, a Republican-controlled uh, Congress uh, made it difficult for him to implement uh, the agreement that he reached. And under President Bush, certainly um, Republican lawmakers supported his efforts to uh, pretty much abandon the framework that Clinton had started. James Dorsey, uh, final thoughts as we wrap. I think that's probably true. One's got to be a little bit careful because, of course, in the in the Clinton period, you were dealing very much with Congress and a and, and, and a and a White House in which partisan politics played a very major role. Uh, at this point, of course, you're dealing with a Congress that's Republican with a Republican president. And I think that the Republican president is going to find that there's a lot of um, different thinking on the way the Korean problem should be approached. We'll leave it there. James Dorsey, author and senior fellow at the Rajaratnam School of International Studies in Singapore. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.